the great organ, and I can hear it back in my office. I've heard that song rehearsed for about a month and a half. Today it was perfect. Praise the Lord. Of course, my office used to be back here. I was going to place my desk when she came. That was a good thing. It's, it's great to open up the Word of God, and it's great to see what the Lord has for us, and it's great to unpack what I think are, are deep things of Scripture, but are given in an understandable way from Scripture. These are things that, as Christ followers, we should know. As we said at the beginning of the series, as we talk about the Apostles' Creed, we believe that the Creed is easy enough for a sixth grader to understand. But also, if you've been a Christian for 60 years, there are probably some new things that you'll continually learn in it. And so that is my hope for us this morning. We're going to begin by reading from the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. These are rich, rich verses of Scripture. As a matter of fact, they're so rich, it's, it's just hard to get them into us on the first reading. So later in the message, I'm going to read them again as well. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. People of God, this is the word of God. Amen. You may be seated. There's a little outline in your bulletin if you want to follow along. So the book of Colossians, it's a letter, a letter that a man by the name of Paul is writing to a church in a town called Colossae. Now, if you've never read this passage before, or if you were opening your Bible for the first time, the word him keeps being used. Anybody let us in on who him is? I heard a faint cry in the back. Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. And so if you go back through and you read all these things, and every time you see the word him, you realize, this is Jesus, this is Jesus, this is Jesus. And what you see is Jesus being raised up as this important, very important, of utmost importance, to the point that we could say, it looks like it's all about Jesus. It is. It is. It's all about Jesus. So we come to this week, and we're talking about, I believe, we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. So there may be some here this morning, uh, and uh, you might be a Christian, and you may wonder, why do we have to talk about the creed? Why all this doctrine? Sometimes the word doctrine might be a turn-off to people. It sounds old. It sounds musty. It sounds difficult. Why do we have to study doctrine? And you might even look ahead on the outline and thought, are these questions and answers from the Heidelberg Catechism? Some of us might have bad memories of going to catechism when we were younger. And unfortunately, somewhere along the way, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. And we don't teach the catechism like we once did. And so we need to continue to bring that up because just like the Apostles' Creed, the catechisms, they teach us, they help us understand the Scripture more clearly. 
And there may be some who haven't placed their faith in Christ that are sitting here this morning. And you might think, oh, wow, this is, this is probably too deep for me. Isn't it true that if I just choose to follow Jesus, isn't that enough? Do I have to know all this doctrine? And then I would pose this question. When you or anybody else says, I believe in Jesus, what does that mean? Is it the same as believing in Abraham Lincoln? Was Jesus just another great man, an honest man, a good teacher? See, there are many in the world that they have minimized Jesus to just be that. Things that could be assigned to Abraham Lincoln and a lot of other people. Or is this the good old American thing to do, you know? God and country. I believe in the man upstairs. That's how some people like to talk about Jesus. It doesn't sound like the Jesus that we just read about in Colossians. Or as many of you have heard of, a man by the name of Tommy Lasorda, out from the Los Angeles way, player and manager for many years, motivational speaker, he's fun to listen to. But Tommy Lasorda always says this, I'm going to go and be with the big Dodger in the sky. People chuckle. Tommy Lasorda is saying a lot about his God when he says that. I don't know that it's the God that we just read about in the book of Colossians. See, those that identify as Jehovah's Witnesses believe in Jesus, but not the same Jesus that we read about in the Bible. The same can be said of Mormons, the same can be said of Muslims, the same with Buddhists, and the list goes on and on. Who is Jesus? Because saying you believe in Jesus isn't enough. We must go further. We need the Jesus of the Bible. And the Apostles' Creed helps us with that. Remember, the creeds help us to identify error that's out there in teaching. The creeds help us in our own spiritual formation, and we never, ever, ever lift or lift the creeds above the Bible. The Bible is always superior. It is the authority for our life. The creeds help explain the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. It should be no surprise that more is devoted in the Apostles' Creed to Jesus than anything else. Essentially, the Creed, the Apostles' Creed, becomes the confession of Jesus Christ. Many people will say that they follow Jesus, but are you actually following the Jesus that is revealed in the Scripture? See, we can go to the Christian bookstore, we can buy all sorts of cutesy food magnets and put them on our refrigerator and have purses with things that identify Jesus, and we get all caught up in all that stuff, but it's are we really following the Jesus of the Scripture? At a point in his ministry, Jesus asked his disciples a very probing question because Jesus knew what was, knew what was going on out there in the crowd. He asked them this question. He said, who, who do other people say I am? I mean, when you're out there in the, in the town, who do other people say I am? Well, so the disciples offered right back, well, some think you're John the Baptist. Others said, something here, Elijah, that prophet, or Jeremiah, that prophet, or just some other prophet. See, there are many out there in the crowds at that time that had different understandings of who Jesus really was. And then Jesus expanded on the question and he said, Well, who do you say I am? And then Peter answered with this very great answer You are the Messiah the Son of the living God. He hit the nail right on the head. See, this question that Jesus asked was so vitally important when he gave it to the disciples, and it's so vitally important for us today. The question goes like this, who do you say that Jesus is? How we answer that question is very pivotal. Because how we answer that question, and there's basically two ways to answer the question, and the two ways that we can answer the question have radically different outcomes. 
See, one answer that we can give is like that of Peter. And maybe it isn't so eloquent as what Peter said, but simply to say this in answer to who is Jesus, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. See, that's significant. That says a lot. Because what happens with that answer, if you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that pathway leads to heaven. And that's a beautiful thing. Well, answer number two are those answers with really no meaning, or sometimes no answer at all. It's answering the question, the big God or the sky, God and country, things like that. Answers that are given that come from the heart of a person who has no relationship with Jesus. And it shows up in their answer. What is the outcome of the wrong answer? Simply this. You will then know Jesus one day as judge. You will know him as judge. And when you know him as judge, on judgment day, please hear people listen to me here. That's not good. It's not good. Because then you will be judged for your sin. Those who are in Christ, those who have received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, their sins have been forgiven. Their sins have been washed away. They will not face Jesus as judge, but those who don't have that relationship, those who haven't claimed Him as Savior, those who haven't sought the forgiveness of their sins, they will face Jesus as judge. And on that judgment day, the words will be, depart from me. Depart from me. It's too late. So, as we look at Jesus, in the creed, and we look at his name, what we see are his purpose, his promise, and his position. The creed helps us with this. And I put some questions and answers from the catechism in your outline, all of which I'm not going to read, but they're there as help for you to understand this further. So the name of Jesus shows his purpose. His purpose is this. He's Savior. He's our Savior. You know, when you look at Matthew one twenty one, and this comes into the, what we would call the Advent story uh, that we read during the Christmas season, the angel is talking to Joseph. And the angel says this, He will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Why was he supposed to be called Jesus? Because Jesus... That word, Yeshua, Joshua in Aramaic, means salvation of God. You see the purpose for Jesus, salvation of God. What do we believe about Jesus? He's our Savior. He saves us from our sin. He saves us from an eternity in hell. That's our Jesus that we get from the Scripture. And you, you see from that catechism answer, the question is, why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Well, because He saved us from our sins. And because salvation should not be sought and cannot be found in anyone else. Folks, that's the truth. Many out there would like to say that there's multiple roads to heaven it just depends on what you believe and who you believe in. That is a big, fat lie. There's no basis for that. We can preach a variety of sermons on how that's... There's no basis for that. There's no truth in that. But that's what is coming out more and more, even what you hear in our country that whatever people want to believe, and this is why Christians will be ridiculed more and more, because Christians who read the Bible and believe this to be the authority that has been given from God, the authoritative will for our life, and when Jesus says, I am 
the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's Jesus as our Savior. And that's so vitally important. The name Christ, the name Christ shows his promise. He is the Messiah. See, some people actually think when they see Jesus Christ, they think Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name. Okay, that's not the way it is. There were other people at the time named Jesus, but there was no one named Jesus Christ. Very significant. We go to Luke chapter 2, again, in what we would call the Christmas story. And the angels said to them, the them were the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this day, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Some translations of Scripture will actually say, rather than Christ the Lord, they will say, Messiah, the Lord. Christ is the anointed one. Remember David in the Old Testament? He was anointed to be king. And now from the line of David comes the fulfillment of all the promises that from David will come the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the anointed one Christ. Promises all throughout the Old Testament through the prophets that the Messiah would come. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the promise. What do we believe about Jesus? He's the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the promised one. There is no one else we are looking for. Jesus is the one. And he's come. He's died. He's rose again. He's ascended into heaven. He is ruling, and one day he will return again. This is our Jesus. And the name Lord shows Jesus' position. Lord of the universe. I mean, think about this, folks. This is awesome. We have the privilege to call Jesus friend. And we do that because he says it. He calls us his friends. And yet he's the Lord of the universe. See, if I've known any powerful people on earth, I've known them because I've seen them on TV. So I don't really know them. They're not in my directory on my phone. I can't call them up. I can't claim that I've been with them. I can't claim that I've gone on vacation. So I may know of powerful people, but I don't really know them. However, we can say with deep conviction that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We call him friend, and make no mistake, he is Lord, he is in charge, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's beautiful. And that's what we read about in our passage from Colossians this morning. And what we do is we get this picture. And the guys who come on uh, uh, Tuesday morning to mention that, we've got a few women that come through. We've been studying the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 2, we get this beautiful picture, this very explicit picture of Christ coming down from heaven to earth. And we see in that passage, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself. Now, when the scripture says he emptied himself, he didn't stop being God at all. But there were things that he did. For instance, he came, the scripture says, in the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. So Jesus became a hundred percent human, and he was also a hundred percent God at the same time. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient 
to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this is so significant because what He did for us is He descended into greatness. A call that He places on our life because it's in that same passage in Philippians it says, your attitude should be the same as Jesus Christ. He left the splendor of heaven. He left that. He became as us, putting on the skin, knowing what temptation was all about, but remaining perfect in all of that. And so that first part of that passage in Philippians, we would call that in theological terms, the humiliation of Christ. That which Christ did for us already, He also calls us to take that attitude. In other words, we may be humiliated for Christ. But look what He did. And then it goes into these words. For this reason God highly exalted Him and gave Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus now is exalted. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. He is reigning. He was humiliated for our sake. And now He is exalted. Again, for our sake. And so we walk with great confidence that Jesus is is Lord. He is ruler. And whatever this world looks like, whatever seems to be happening out there, whatever sort of things seem to be spiraling down, Jesus is Lord. He is in control. He will come back. And He will take His children home with Him. So we believe in Jesus who is Lord. We believe in Jesus who is above all. We believe in a Jesus that is sovereign. So when it comes to the Apostles' Creed, we don't often use the word begotten like we used to. It's kind of a word that we don't use in our language every day. We use the word only son now when we're referring to this. Here's some things to remember about this. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, remember? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, He was in heaven with God. And at that time, He was the only Son of the Father. Why is it important that Jesus is the only Son of the Father? Why is it important that He is begotten? Well, first of all, it's very important to know that Jesus isn't the creature. In other words, He wasn't created at any time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit existed in all eternity past. They have been forever and will exist in all eternity future. See, false religions out there said, well, Jesus was created. Uh Uh-uh. If He was created, then He wouldn't be God. Jesus is the only Son, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has always been. He will always be. But you might say, well, doesn't it say that when we become Christians, don't we become sons and daughters of the King? Yes, we do. But there's one significant difference. We're adopted sons and daughters. We're adopted. Jesus is the only son, the only begotten son. But we are adopted. And what a beautiful thing that we would be adopted because of what Jesus has done on the cross We get to be adopted into the family, and the Bible even goes so far as to say, we get to be heirs. We get to receive riches because we're in that family, and those riches are the eternal riches that we have waiting for us in heaven, and we get little tastes along the way while we're here in earth. So, let's go back to Colossians. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Let's read these words now together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile everything to Himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. This passage of Scripture is so rich it puts Jesus right where He belongs on the throne. He is King. Dear people, everybody needs to think. Sometimes, maybe more times than we should, we try to be the King of our own life. And you know what happens when we do that? We tend to make messes. Amen? So nations have kings, and they have presidents, and they have prime ministers, and they make messes. Amen? Yes. I'm not trying to put anybody down, either in this room or who occupy offices in this country or other places. But today we talk about a king, King Jesus, who came to bring light and to bring it to the full. When we submit our lives to Christ, that doesn't mean that there will be no more problems. However, what we have, and we're reminded in this passage, is that we have reconciliation. We have reconciliation with God the Father. So that relationship which was severed all the way back in the beginning in Genesis has now been reconciled through Jesus Christ so that we get to be included in the family of God, so we get to be saved from the fires of hell, so we get life to the fullest right here and right now because Jesus is our King. That is a beautiful thing. Our lives are actually new. So there are some people in this room this morning that believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Praise the Lord. And you are continuing, whether you're 90 years old or 9 years old, you're continually learning how to submit, how to surrender our lives more and more to Jesus. That's what walking and following Christ is all about. Now, there are others in the room who don't necessarily go that far. They, they may believe that they're a good person. I don't do this church thing too often. I don't go to Bible studies at church. I'm sure they might turn it so many things in order. I come once in a while. And, um, yeah, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And if they ever think about judgment, here's what they think. They often think this. And I, don't, I only say this because I've heard it so many times. You know, God's not going to judge me. I mean, I've read the papers, I've seen the news. There's a lot of people out there that are way worse than me. They're going to get it, not me. I kind of sort of maybe believe in God. I've heard the stories, you know, with Sunday school kids and all that stuff. But, you know, he's not into this stuff. But I, I know I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody, I haven't beat up anybody, I don't say many bad words. I'm a good person. So my only follow-up to that, of which I hear often, is this. Whose who standard are you using to determine that you're a good person? See, humanly speaking, we all like to think that God's going to grade on the curve, right? That wouldn't it be nice, this loving God, if He just takes all these kind of good people, my definition, of course, Good people, he's going to bring those to heaven. And then those really rock, terrible people that we read about in the headlines that are sitting in prison that have done terrible, hated, awful things. Those people are going to go to hell. But then this big, big group of just nice people, people who love old ladies across the street, people who buy Girl Scout cookies, 
you know, these people are going to go to heaven, right? Right? Surely right. I'm, I'm one of those good people, right? Big gods are in the sky. It sounds nice. Sounds like it'd make a good magnet in a Christian bookstore or Walmart. But dear people, it's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says all the sin that falls short of the glory of God. That every one of us in this room, and there's some really good people in this room, everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. And when we fall short of the glory of God, we don't make it on what we've done. We only make it on what Jesus has done. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes so far as to say, when we look at the size of these two groups, the group that's actually going to heaven, that, that is, is a narrow gate. There's not many that are going to make it. But the road that leads to hell is really good. And a lot of people are going to go there. That's the condition of the world. See, I don't need a Savior unless I realize that I'm being saved from something. But what we're being saved from is a life of torment apart from God. And you save us into a renewed life now to be new living people, new creations, and this all happens because of the work of Jesus. Dear people, we need a king. And that king is Jesus. And we are invited to the table this morning. We are invited to the table to receive the grace that the Lord has for us. I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for Jesus. We are so grateful, Father, that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus. That Jesus would die on the cross for our sins. And that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, Lord, as we've talked about this this morning, and as we've talked about who Jesus really is according to the Scriptures. Lord, perhaps you're knocking at the door of someone's heart here right now, someone who needs to receive that Jesus. Not the Jesus that they've made up. Not the Jesus for just the good person that they think they might be, but the Jesus who saves us from our sin and makes us new. And there are those people here this I pray that not only would pray, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I've fallen short, that I need Jesus. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord and leader of my life because I truly believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I'm going to commit no longer to casual Christianity, no longer to convenient Christianity, but I'm going to commit to following you as you have commanded, has commanded me in Scripture to follow you. And may all the pleasure that I have the rest of my life be found solely in you. And we look at you.